This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Welcome to another episode of Tau Unbound. I'm Ido Aharoni, your host, and today it is my privilege and my pleasure to host Dr. Boaz Amiri. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Welcome to our podcast. Thank to you. our listeners and our viewers, let me just say, Boaz Amiri is a lecturer and the head of the Evans Program in Conflict Management and Mediation at Tel Aviv University's Faculty of Social Studies, Social Sciences. He also serves as a Human Development Lab researcher at the Boris Mintz Institute, got his PhD from Tel Aviv University in Social Psychology, and then did his postdoctoral work at uh, uh, Pennsylvania University, which University of Pennsylvania, Penn, which recently also met the headlines in some, uh, um, you know, unpleasant circumstances. We'll talk about that too. So again, welcome to our podcast. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your area of expertise. Naturally, since October 7th, people like you that specialize in understanding the psychological barriers behind every conflict become very, very, you know, the, the demand is very high to hear from people like you. So tell us about your area of expertise. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you again for, for having me. Um, so um, my field of research in general is trying to understand the psychology of intergroup conflicts, um, why people engage in conflict, why it's so difficult to uh, resolve conflicts uh, in a peaceful manner, um, and then trying to understand uh, how we can take this information or, or knowledge about the psychological barriers, the psychological infrastructure um, that is part of, of uh, the human nature, trying to take this in, um, knowledge to develop psychological interventions to promote, to, to uh, promote conflict resolution, to promote better inter intergroup relations, um, and so on. So um, this is what I've been doing since, since I started my, my short career uh, as a PhD student a few years ago. Um, I uh, studied uh, at the beginning mostly the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and then I moved on to other contexts. And more recently, I've been uh, studying more uh, conflicts that are actually outside of Israel, um, uh, in Colombia, in Nigeria, and other places. And I'll be happy to, to talk about those as well. Now, when you say that you're interested in the psychological dimension, does that mean that uh, we neutralize the cultural impact? Because we do know that... certain elements have different interpretation in different territories and different cultures for example the concept of time um, you know we all we're all familiar with the idea of blood feuds that can last generations if not centuries in the Middle East but in other cultures like the Western civilization um, uh, you know it's easier to resolve those conflicts with a simple court case or compromise. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think that initially this field of, of psychology and psychology and social psychology in particular was trying to um, develop this like general uh, psychology that uh, might be relevant to everybody all over the world, regardless of the context. Uh, and, that, and that I think was a mistake, uh, trying to just um, say that there are some fundamental psychological processes that are just exactly the same. wherever you go. I think that more recently, this research has evolved, trying to take the context more into account. It's not great. There's still much more work to, 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 to develop this idea, to develop this understanding of how context shape um, the psychology and psychological interventions in particular, which is something that I uh, find very interesting and important to, to study. Uh, but um, yeah, there's a process towards trying to understand better the, the context. Would you, would you say that the theoretical concept and you're coming from social sti studies yeah. of multiculturalism stands in the way of your research because multiculturalism assumes that there is no such thing as high cultures versus versus low culture uh, that, that most that we can talk about a one culture is borrowing elements from another culture but the idea that there is no one definite right and one definite wrong uh, may stand in the way at least from my perspective and Of, of the kind of research that you're trying to engage in? Um, I think that uh, um, to an extent, uh, but, but I mean, bottom line, 
I think that um, there's a shift in psychology in general, not only in, in the work I'm, I've been doing and the work my colleagues and friends have, have been doing in the past years, trying to, to understand the contextual impact. Um, I think that there's uh, um, there's a shift uh, trying to better understand um, how situations and contextual cues and contextual um, trying to understand how how broadly speaking the context may sh sh uh, shape our psychological um, behavior and such psychological uh, uh, understanding of of situations um, so I'm not sure if I um, if I answered your question uh, but I think that uh, um, Bottom line, uh, we need to understand how contexts shape the psychology of individuals. Yeah, and the word context yeah. is very tricky. We'll talk about that okay. uh, later. But let, let's jump right into the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, okay. which you studied. Uh, what, what did you learn uh, from a fundamental point of view, mean, meaning the fundamentals of the conflict? Uh, what are what have you learned through your research, and what can you tell us about the future of the conflict based on what happened on October seventh? Yeah, that's a, that's a very difficult question, and I'm not sure I can actually answer it. What what I can say is the following: uh, the research on um, psychological or, or or on on intergroup conflicts, broadly speaking, um, argues that there are different types of conflicts. Uh, there are conflicts that are more uh, intractable and conflicts that are less intractable. Um, and this is based on uh, the work, fundamental work of, of my, one of my PhD advisors, uh, Danny, Daniel Bartal, Professor Daniel Bartal, who was actually here in this building for many years. He's been, he's been uh, retired for a few years now. He, he was one of our first guests on oh, okay. this podcast. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of his work. Uh, so we spoke about the whole idea of the... Uh, uh, the Masada complex. Right, yeah. Um, so yeah, so he argues that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is an intractable conflict, which means that uh, his, uh, this, the conflict has lasted for, for many decades, uh, and, and uh, it's violent. Uh, it has all these psychological characteristics that differentiate it from other types of conflict that are uh, more tractable, right? Um, and so this means that uh, in this context, um, each side thinks, for example, that uh, the conflict is a zero-sum sum game, right? If I win, you lose, and if you win, I lose. Um, and this affects how people perceive the conflict, perceive things that are happening in the conflict. Um, there are all of these uh, different psychological uh, elements and infrastructure that uh, people develop when they live in such a conflict. So, for example, if I, as, an, as a Jewish Israeli, uh, uh, is born in this context, I've been, I am being socialized to think different things and believe different beliefs that are associated with the conflict. Um, so I think, for example, uh, and, I've, uh, I'm, and I'm socialized to think that from, again, the day I'm born from different social, socialization uh, uh, channels, such as the media, schools, education, leaders, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, so I think, for example, that I'm the victim in the conflict and the other side uh, is the per perpetrator. That my goals are just, while the other side's goals are unjust, etc. So I have these sets of, set of beliefs that I believe. Um, and um, this, according to the theory, and going back to the contextual uh, um, issue, uh, the, 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 the argument that Danny Bartal and others have been making is that these beliefs are generally similar across contexts of intractable conflict. So if you would go to uh, study the conflict in Sri Lanka, for example, you'll hear similar, similar things or similar strands of, 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 of beliefs and, and, and attitudes that are being developed by people who live there, etc. Um, so all of this is making the conflict uh, uh, um, uh, intractable because these set of beliefs that have been socialized to people who live in this context are so entrenched that it's so difficult to change them, right? Um, so if, I'm, if I believe that from the day I was born that I'm the victim and the other side is a perpetrator and I should not trust them, so 
it's very difficult to change it when, for example, an actual uh, um, opportunity to to you know to to uh, promote uh, a peaceful resolution uh, uh, will will face this, and and it will be very difficult to change this because if I have if I've if I'm not believe if I'm if I'm not trusting the other side for so many years, why should I trust them now? Why now should... you're you're talking about paradoxical thinking as one of the ways to break that loop. Right. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, so, so the argument is that it's so difficult to um, it's so difficult to change these beliefs because they are so entrenched. Right. We've been socialized to think that from day day one, from day zero, that we were, were born. So, trying to persuade people with with counter information, trying to tell them, look, the other side is is actually you know they're they're real like they're good people like you. They they also want to live a peaceful life, etc., etc. So trying to persuade people with this type of information is really difficult, right? Uh, because people will just will not buy in to this information. So in my PhD with my advisors, uh, Dani Bartal, I mentioned, and Ran Halperin, who is now in the Hebrew University, uh, we developed this uh, idea of paradoxical thinking, with, which is basically, instead of trying to persuade people with counter-information, what we try to do there is to take whatever they believe and just take it to the extreme, amplify it, exaggerate it until they themselves think that whatever they think is basically or maybe uh, in, uh, nonsensical or absurd. Yeah, far-fetched. Far-fetched, yeah. Now, can you give us an example uh, from the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict of, of paradoxical thinking? Yeah, so, so in one study, for example, we... Um, Develop this set of questions uh, that we ask participants, and and w one question uh, built off this idea that many people in Israel, Jewish Israelis, think that the other side just tries to harm to to harm us, right? Um, so we ask this question, something along the lines of, why do you think that Palestinians try to harm us? Uh, and this is such a basic need that they have that it you know surpasses their need for for basic health and, and, you know, having food on their tables, right? So instead of just asking them a simple question, we took it one step further, right? And then people heard this question and said, yeah, I mean, you know, some maybe want to harm us, but, yeah, I mean, most people probably do want to be healthy, right, and have food on their tables. So, so this made people to take a step backward to somewhat moderate their views. Now, when you talk about scaling this up, so, right, you're describing one small research that you conducted. But let's say you, you come to a, a conflict like this, and forget the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Let's talk about the French and the Germans yeah. that for hundreds of years were fighting each other. And the culmination was World War II. And today, I, I don't think that there's a lot of love between the French people and the German people, but they've been um, um, you know, coexisting peacefully yeah. For, for decades. So, so, so what can we learn from that example or from the, from the success of the American Marshall Plan post-World War II? Um, I think that what we can learn and something that we're actually trying to use in, in some of our research is that there's hope. <laughs> um, I mean, people have been in conflict for many, many years, for decades or centuries, but now they, you know, maybe they don't love each other, but they live peacefully. So this can also potentially happen here, right? Um, so, yeah, we, we've, uh, my, myself and others try to, to take this idea and try to, you know, teach people, you know, something along the lines of what you just said and see how this affects uh, other people when they thought about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in speci uh, specifically. And what we see is that it does induce hope in many cases when people think that they actually can learn something from the other context, because sometimes they say, oh, well, you know, but these are Europeans, they're Christians, it's a, it's a whole different story, and we are, this is a religious conflict, so it doesn't apply to us, etc. But yeah, I mean, we have all these examples all over the world of, of countries or nations that have been in conflict for decades or centuries, and it ended, right? So it can also end here. So it's a hopeful message, I think. Yeah, well, I, you know, continue this line of, of thought. I would say that very few Israelis thought in October of 1973 that six years later, Israel will sign a peace treaty with 
its most bitter enemy, Egypt. Yeah. Uh, so that's on the positive side. On the negative side, you hear more and more Israelis, and uh, just came back from a month-long speaking tour in North America, so you hear this also from more and more North Americans, Jews and non-Jews, that um, it's the same sentiment post 9-11, meaning it's an inter-civilizational clash between two cultures, mm -hmm. one that is centered around the concept of life, yeah. the glorification of life, the nurturing of life, the cultivation of life, and one that is centers around the concept of death. Because mm -hmm. when, you, when you look at the Hamas charter, when you look at what their speech is, when you look at what they're saying, it's all about dying and killing, and it's all about the past. Yeah. There's nothing about the future, there's nothing about creation, there's nothing about progress. So, and I think that leads to people to almost clinical, collective clinical depression. The realization that maybe we're looking at this insol insolvable, yeah. inter-civilizational clash. What, what, what would you say to people like that? Uh -huh. um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that uh, um, immediately after such a massive event happens, such a massive terrorist attack happens, I think that we there's not a lot that we can say right to um to um help people to um cope with this i think that it's perfectly understandable and it's natural to think that um and i think that um all the work that i've uh read uh, and, and been exposed to on you know psychological intervention etc have not studied uh interventions immediately after the aftermath of such uh, a massive, you know, uh, um, terrible, uh, uh, tragic event. Um, and this, the, little, the little work that I've been exposed to actually shows that interventions are just not effective when you try to apply them immediately after such, uh, such a terrorist attack. So there was research by uh, uh, Van Ash and colleagues trying to see how people, uh, whether interventions are effective after, um, in the aftermath of the Paris um, terrorist attack and the uh, terrorist attack in Brussels, and it was just ineffective. So I think that in terms of like what I do, I think that I don't have much to offer in, in this specific case, other than that, then trying to basically be very empathetic and, 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 uh, and, hum and, and, and um, yeah, be, being very empathetic about what people think and and how people f feel and just yeah just uh, um acknowledge that it's such a tragic effect, effect uh, event um and it's traumatizing and it's natural to feel these feelings but it doesn't mean that this needs to last forever right it can change so this is i think what i will try to convey. so i think that what you're trying to say is that your approach is more strategic and therefore it's not a tool that you use in times of crisis and right now we are in the midst of the crisis yeah yeah so what you're doing is more strategic and i see that you're also deploying advertising and media experts and you work with media labs and and um now would you say that the halo effect is impacting conflict as well uh, let me, uh, you mentioned Nigeria, you mentioned other cases in, in, in Latin America, but I'm thinking about the, you know, research that I, I was involved in uh, about Israel. So what we discovered, this is research that was conducted uh, late 2008, early 2009, just as Operation Cast Lead was launched in Gaza. And what we learned was something very interesting. We went to 20, I think it was 14 countries, 14 countries, including China and Russia. And what we discovered was very interesting. We discovered that people knew only one thing about Israel, yeah. which is that Israel is engaged in this seemingly insurmountable conflict with the Palestinians. And because they knew one that, that one piece of information, they drew a whole set of conclusions about everything else in Israel. So when they were asked about the domestic situation in Israel, they said it was horrible. The economy wasn't doing great. The culture was very bad, and so on and so forth. Do you see that in your research, the impact of the halo effect? Um, so I haven't, in, in, in all of my studies, what I usually try to do is try to take group 
members of a certain group, so Jewish Israelis, Colombians, etc., trying to um, change their views about the conflict, about their, themselves, and about the out group. So I think that I, I see the, this effect when when I ask people about mostly about the uh, out group and the conflict, uh, because this paints or colors everything else they they um, they uh, they they know about the out group. So. Um, there's this uh, a phenomenon in psychology um, where you ask people uh, to think about the in-group, they see that the in-group is very diverse, right? There are people who are opposed to conflict, people who are more hawkish, people who are more dovish, etc. But when they think about the out-group, the enemy, they actually think that they are all the same, right? So they are all, I don't know, um, ag aggressive, um, unpleasant, whatever, you know, very negative um, uh, views about the out group. So I think that this is when I see this, um, this phenomena. I think that when we talk about, when we ask people to, to describe or think about what the out group think, they immediately think about them um, in the, through the prism of the conflict, right? Um, and this is one of the things that we try to break when we try to develop psychological intervention. We try to break this very monolithic way of viewing the out group, the enemy, and the conflict. Now, naturally, all the methodologies that you're talking about uh, should have been embraced by the diplomatic establishment because diplomacy essentially, at least in its purest definition, diplomacy is about conflict resolution, is about finding compromise, yeah. is about finding solutions to problems that do not require military force. Uh, sadly, this is not the case with Israeli diplomacy that has always been a, you know, an extension of Israel's military thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, a big question that we have is, have you, have you been able to share any of your findings with Israeli decision makers or Israeli uh, influencers? Uh, so, uh, not so much. Um, I think that uh, the language of psychological barriers and, and, and you know, psychological infrastructure to conflict and all that, I think it's, it's becoming more and more um, common um, in, in the Israeli di diplomacy, um, not because of me, <laughs> uh, but maybe they were exposed to, to some of my work. Um, I think that um, it just became something that, in general, worldwide, uh, diplomats and policymakers are just more open to in, in recent years. Um, so I've been working a little bit with, with the UN on some, some issues and with some organizations in, in South America. And it seems that there's some, some genuine interest in these ideas. Um, but uh, personally, I wasn't really uh, involved in any discussions with Israeli diplomats uh, in any way, unfortunately. Now, we, we asked before we started the, uh, the recording, uh, we, we had a little conversation about what's happening on campus in yeah. the United States today, which is, a, uh, I think, a, a manifestation of something that is more profound and more it runs deeper, which is the creation of this binary worldview, which is perhaps a result of the tremendous impact of the technological algorithm. Maybe it has to do with overprotective parenting, as, as Jonathan Haidt is claiming um, in his book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, we have, a, especially among younger people, this view of the world that is non-compromising, binary, is either the absolute good versus the absolute evil, and evil has to be eradicated. These people are being, they feel unsafe whenever uh, a concept they're not familiar with is presented to them, mm -hmm. uh, and they respond almost violently yeah. to it. And, uh, and I think that what we see today uh, on campus, which many people predicted and spoke about it years ago, um, is very disturbing yeah. to many people that care about the future of open, pluralistic, democ democratic societies. Mm -hmm. And the question is, can we use any of your tools to handle that situation? Because it seems to me like it's almost the same 
conflict that you're talking about, the same characteristics, the labeling of the other side as the as the ultimate evil. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think that one more reason why this is has been happening um, in in on campuses in the U.S. but but in other places is also um, this trend toward uh, um, more of a I want to say tribalism, even though I don't really like that term, but um, but create um, thinking about the world in terms of, of groups. Um, and I think that what has been happening in the U.S. is that this like um, process of of, uh, um, of of differentiating between different groups has become very monolithic. So if I am uh, you know woke, <laughs> or I think about myself as a woke person. Um, and I, uh, I think of myself as a liberal person who support, you know, LGBTQ uh, uh, and other minorities. Then immediately, what I, it, this means is that, is that I need to support um, Palestinians in this case because they are, you know, the, uh, according to their perspective, the weak side, um, and they need support. Um, and this is something that is um, that is also, uh, I think, very related to intergroup. Uh, sorry, to group uh, processes, because if I am part of this group, I need to show everybody in this group that I am really a part of the group, and I need to prove it again and again, right? Um, so yeah, That's the famous uh, virtue signaling that everybody's talking about. Yeah, so so I need to show them that I'm fully supporting the, the cause, and, and, you know, and, and this means that uh, if, if I need to show some more aggression, that I'll use aggression, um, because, there, yeah, as you said, there's no... Uh, there's no gray, right? It's everything. It's either I'm part of the group, and this group means this set of things, and and I cannot be different from my peers, right? Because they immediately sig signal me out, and and immediately I'll need to prove myself, and and that's a reinforcing cycle. Um, how can we use the the tools that I've been working on to to try to um, to break this, um, that's a good question. I think that it depends on who are we uh, talking about in terms of, of the group. I think that those who are more extreme, I would maybe try to use paradoxical thinking because uh, it is a very extreme view to think everything in such a black and white uh, way. And so you can take that and exaggerate that and make people to try to, to make, make them question themselves maybe. Uh, if people are just, um, you know, peripheral to the group, and they are not strong believers, then we can think about other ways um, to just persuade them using very convincing information. Um, and what about um, the psychological warfare approach uh, of uh, just uh, planting the seed of doubt? So that doesn't require any hard evidence. That doesn't require any information. It just requires creative thinking. Yeah. that is meant to people to have people begin question a little bit yeah the the core beliefs of the of the group yeah um i think that it, it depends on, on what type of belief you're talking about because if if we're talking about beliefs that are very um contentious such as you know beliefs about the israeli palestinian conflict among americans it's a very contentious, contentious issue, then I think that, you know, sowing this um, uh, doubt, uh, this seed of doubt, is very difficult. Um, I think that you need to be clever about it. Um, so by using, for example, paradoxical thinking or other ways, I don't think that it will be easy just to, you know, say something uh, small that will then, you know, become it will become bigger and bigger until people will actually doubt themselves. Uh, I'll give you an example. Yeah. So one of the main arguments that the uh, that is being made against Israel, and again, everybody's linking it to the theories of uh, Edward Said and uh, Orientalism and so on, yeah. viewing Zionism as part of European colonialism, right. coming from Americans who live in states named Massachusetts and Connecticut. Or from people that live in Arizona that was uh, under Mexican rule for many many years. Uh, so the question is, how do you use the methodology of seeding doubt mm -hmm. 
uh, to undermine the false narrative of Zionism equals colonialism. Yeah. Um, so, um, I mean, there is research showing that you can make these comparisons uh, between different contexts and, and trying to people trying to get the people to understand the the double standards that they have sometimes when they you know are in one context and it's um, you know it's based on on you know what you just said uh, in the U.S. Uh, and then trying to get them to make that uh, connection to extrapolate that to a different context. And I think that that's, you know, fine, that, that, can, that can work. But uh, there's this, I think, beautiful uh, documentary uh, by uh, Ranan Aleksandrovich, if I'm not mistaken. It's called, it's called The Viewing Booth. Um, and what you see in that movie or documentary is these uh, Jewish American um, students in, 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 in U.S. universities being exposed to uh, footage from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And they are asked to just say what they have in, you know, what go, goes on in their mind while, the, while they uh, watch, these, watch this footage. And what you see there is how people are very, very capable to justify and provide different explanations that go in line with whatever they think and, and then just resist this like very compelling footage from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So people are very capable, very good at resisting information that just doesn't fit whatever uh, they believe. So I think that... Which is the famous cognitive dissonance. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, so, so I think that um, in cases where people are so strongly, feel so strongly about something, it's very difficult to use like this... Uh, you know, nice uh, manipulative ways to to make them uh, change their views um, because they are very good at resisting it. Now, Dr. Ameri, we, we could continue with this for a long time because such a fascinating uh, conversation, but because time is running up. Let me ask you one last question. Can you share with us one example of successful or uh, insightful case of conflict resolution uh, for our viewers and our listeners to take home with them. Yeah, I mean, so um, I, I can I can talk about my uh, work. I think in in Colombia, which I think is a fascinating uh, example. Uh, so Colombia has been um, uh, immersed in conflict for several decades. Uh, one of the most violent conflicts in the world um, between essentially the Colombian government and different uh, organizations that separated from the Colo from the Colombian society to form these radical uh, leftist uh, communist uh, organizations that became very very uh, uh, violent uh, through the years, thinking that they need to protect the uh, rural people in Colombia um, from exploitation. Um, so after uh, fifty something years, uh, they signed a peace agreement in 2016 um, and I think that uh, um, so th this process has been very difficult it's not a very successful process because the peace signed uh, the peace accord was signed but the process has been uh, fluctuating um, um, some some uh, um, movement towards uh, reintegration of these extreme organizations in the Colombian society has been uh, underway it's been somewhat successful, but not uh, entirely successful, and there's some issues with corruption, etc. But I think that what I'm trying to say with all of this is that even though the process was not ideal, and, and um, it's not entirely clear what will happen there, what is definitely clear is that even though that's the situation, the support for peace has been um, absolutely uh, at the highest levels ever, right? So before the peace accord, um, levels of support in, in a referendum that was conducted were around 49%. And then after that, it's been around 80 to 90%, um, which means that even, even if the process is not ideal, people still want it because they understand um, that it's necessary and it's good for them, right? And that that's interesting. That's interesting. And also, I would say, in the case of Colombia, another interesting point is that whether the opposition or the government, both of them, would like to associate themselves with the 
narrative of the Palestinian as the underdogs. Yeah. And they're competing who would support the Palestinians more. And that's also, again, indication of their own self-perception. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this enlightening conversation. Thank you. And we hope to uh, have you here with us as a guest again in the future. And to our viewers and listeners back home, goodbye from Tel Aviv until the next episode of Tao Unbound. This is Tao Unbound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat.